Hello, and welcome to the June episode of the Patron Program, a look at the Masters. When you hear the word silence, do you associate it with empty, dead? Can you reposition yourself, take a different perspective? To see silence as full and living? This month, we explore a more mystical aspect of painting. We examine how some of the masters represented spaciousness. In my classes, I use terms like atmosphere, distance, vague, gray, and nothing to represent this idea of spaciousness as something that is full and alive and deserving of its place on the canvas. With our theme of spaciousness in mind, let us revisit the paintings we saw in the introduction, giving each of them space and time in our attention, so that we might explore how the artist achieved a sense of spaciousness that is vastly more expansive than the canvas holding the paint. We begin with a living artist, Tim Allen Lawson, born in 1963. How did he give spaciousness a leading role in this painting? How do the deer near the bottom of the canvas stay as supporting roles and not move into a leading role in this painting? So if we look just at the bottom portion of this painting, and if the deer do not have a leading role, they're sitting in there very quietly, aren't they? Because the value and the color of the deer aren't so far removed from the surroundings. They're actually very close. So what does have a leading role in this portion of the painting? Well, I think very obviously, the patches of snow, along with a little bit of water reflecting the sky. Can you notice how the patch of snow is winding you along with the water through this portion of the canvas? Because the deer are so quiet, in other words, the notes of paint that make up the deer are relatively close to their surroundings in both color and value. It's not so different from that. They sit in there very quietly. Yet if we look at the patch of snow, it is a definite light surrounded by dark. Light surrounded by darker at a higher measure. So there's more, dis there's more difference between the notes of paint that make up the snow versus what's immediately surrounding the snow and the water. So one reason the deer stay at supporting roles is because the patch of snow, the notes of snow and water are so much louder than the notes of paint that make up the deer. Then if we have focus our attention on the sky, there's not a whole lot going on in the sky, is there? We've got the treetop as a dark against the light background of the sky. 
and then there's a cloud that is also a slight dark on a light. But the main attraction up here is the color. The color gives these values some added power. And notice how the sky, you can pick up that movement of a darker, richer color to a lighter, grayer color. That's a theme we're going to see over and over again, that darker, richer to lighter, grayer. And finally, let's look at the middle section of the painting. Not much going on there at all. So one of the ways he's given spaciousness a role is not to play up too many quote unquote objects or things. So far, we've got the patches of snow, a little bit of water reflecting the sky in the foreground. The sky didn't have very many things either, but it did have some strong color. And then you can see this middle ground is very quiet too. Other than some small patches of snow, which are just lights on darks, there's not much to see here at all. But what he does have in here again is darker, richer to lighter, grayer as we move back. So if we want to have paint give the illusion of distance or traveling three-dimensionally into the canvas, in other words, if we really think about this, this is a flat piece of canvas or linen right here. This is exactly, and this are on the same plane. And part of what we want to do as an artist is take a two-dimensional surface, the canvas, and turn it into a three-dimensional illusion, like walking through rolling fields of grass with little patches of snow. So there's not very many objects in this painting. The objects that are there, the deer, a lot of the trees are very quiet. And so that all we really see is the patches of snow and a little bit of reflected sky and then the color of the sky. That may sound simple enough, but the problem is, even if you don't have a lot of objects, you still have to put paint everywhere. So how can you put paint down without painting objects that still attract the interest of the viewer? One of the ways you can do that is Whatever they do see, make sure it's very interesting. What an interesting, beautiful shape and movement the snow creates. Do you see how strong that movement is? Beautiful shape just meandering and wandering and taking you through and introducing you to the middle ground. And with simple repetition, and then some color. By the way, I know this looks like really, really bright color, but I think you would be shocked if we took a really strong orange or a really strong blue at that value and set it up there. He's been very reserved in everything he's done. So once you have some experience as an artist, you quickly realize that color always gets all the credit all the fame, all the glory. But color actually doesn't do that much. It does some, but most of the work is done by the value. And by value, we're talking about simply how dark or light the paint is. So you see the contrast in value with the snow in the front of the painting and how that value is so much more, that value difference, that impact, the, the note, 
that that contrast makes. How much less that is than the tree and the cloud in the sky. And as we look across our middle ground at those patches of snow, just how much noise are they really making? They're not. So do you see how we have this strong movement in the foreground that introduces us into the middle ground where almost nothing is happening? Yet within that nothingness, there's a consistency of moving, of moving back into space. And that consistency is our darker and richer to our lighter grayer. I think now in black and white, you can clearly see there's an overall rhythm of darker to lighter as we move across and back into. Notice even he's got it lighter, excuse me, darker, rich to lighter, grayer. It's darker over here and it's a little lighter over here. So there's also the movement from darker, richer to lighter, grayer this way, isn't there? To master your movement, to master your gradations of paints, your value arrangements, to be able to mix up darker, richer, and then transform that paint into lighter, grayer paint, to sit within the appropriate value, is a skill and a skill that we as artists have to develop early. And really without that skill, to control those values and to control those colors, it's almost like we lack the skill to steer and to accelerate and brake in a car, right? If, if we don't know how to steer a car or how to accelerate a car or brake a car, how are we going to control where that car goes? The same is true of painting. Unless you can control the movement of your values and the movement of your colors, you're not quite in control of the car yet. Our next painter is also a living artist, Clyde Aspavig, born in 1951. And we're going to start looking at this piece in black and white before we go to the color. Again, to see the bones, to see what all the work is about. And the first thing I'd like you to notice is it's actually a pretty simple value arrangement. Now he's got a lot of different shapes and things going on, but there really isn't a ton of values. We have the uprights, the trees, right here in our face in the foreground. And then we have the hills in the background sharing some of those values. We have the grass in the immediate foreground interrupted by the snow. So we have the values of the trees going back into space. We have the value of the grass. And then we have the snow as our big characters. And of course we have our sky as well. One of the things that's hardest to teach and hardest to make people understand is how do you represent detail without actually drawing each blade of grass? If we look at this as just a shape, can you see how this shape of the grass right here is very, very, very active, especially if we compare it to the grass in the distance. So the simple nature of the shape, along with the size, can portray distance or difference in the paint. How has he represented that the grass is all pokely and sprickly and where the snow is laying more flat? He's done that without color or without detail. 
And then although it does seem like that tree is very close to us, it's not right at the tip of our nose, is it? We are going to have to walk over to touch the trunk of that tree. But most of the spaciousness in this painting occurs behind the trees. So in a way, the spaciousness is pushing that foreground towards us. And then like all great paintings, the color never fights the value set up, but it works hand in hand to enhance the value set up. How does this yellow grass and shadow in the foreground differ from the yellow grass behind the first patch of snow? Does it travel in, from darker, richer, near to lighter, grayer, back? And then the light hits the grass, right? And then where that light hits the grass, behind the grass and shadow and in front of those trees, that small patch of yellow right there, it also goes from darker, richer, to lighter, grayer. So there's this constant movement. And it's not an arbitrary movement. It's a very controlled movement. Controlled in value, controlled with color, controlled with the nature of the shape. This painting by Frederick Edwin Church, 1826 to 1900, an American painter, also has vast spaciousness in it. This is kind of incredible for just how empty most of the canvas is. Now it's not literally empty, there's paint on it, but the fog turns into an emptiness. It consumes the objects and the material world. To we're, until we're left with this vague, gray nothingness. But what little bit he does give us for the sand and the rocks of the shore, they even go from darker, richer to lighter, grayer. And the darks of the couple of rocks in the foreground, back to the rowboat, and then back to the boat, darker, richer, lighter, grayer. There's a particular pattern. Again, color should add to the scene, but it can never make the scene. The values are the structure that hold the painting together. So you can represent this idea of spaciousness before you even get to color. You can work out the spaciousness idea with just the value. The German artist Edward Theodore Compton, 1849 to 1921. So let's say you and I are sitting together at the edge of this scene right here. And we're going to take a little break and drink some water. And I say, oh man, you know what? I think I left my water bottle on that far ridge back there. Would you mind running over there and just grabbing that for me? Well, that would be a hard no from me because that's more than just a step or two over there, isn't it? That's gonna take a really long time to get back there. So do you see how it goes from darker to lighter as those mountains get further back into space? And again, the color adds but it doesn't build the scene. It decorates the scene. The final artist for the day is an American painter, John F. Folsenby, 1892 to 1972. And I wanted to end on this because of the fact there's so little color here. Sometimes in modern life, we can get bombarded with color and with noise and with activity. And it's easy to forget the value 
and even the insight of spaciousness. Composition essentially comes down to your something versus your nothing. And understanding the relationship between the somethingness and the nothingness in paintings not only makes you a better artist, but can enrich in your life. So wherever you are, I hope that you're able to appreciate a little spaciousness in your life and in your work. Until next time, this is Jason Meyer signing off.